Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Stephanie Spisco, and I am the program administrator for the business law section of the Florida Bar. Um, I would like to welcome you to course number 5028, Nuts and Bolts of the Legislative Process. Um, I will also put that in the chat so everyone can see that course number later on. Um, today's presentation is brought to you by the business law section of the Florida Bar, and we have actually produced many of these CLEs over the course of the last year and a half um, due to COVID. Um, this CLE will be up for um, after market so that you can go ahead and take a look at it if for some reason you miss any portion of it um, or if you'd like to refer back to it, it will be on our YouTube page. Um, it should be posted within a week or so. Um, we also have lots of other CLEs that you can find on that YouTube page. Um, you can also go to the CLE section of the Florida Bar and there are several um, CLEs that are up for purchase if you would like to look into some of those. Um, if you have any questions about becoming a member or if you have questions about the section, you are welcome to reach out to me. My information is on all of the business law section uh, website pages as well as the business law section page of the Florida Bar. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, this CLE is one hour and it is set up on the Zoom webinar platform. Um, so that is set up so that the only videos that are available um, as well as the only microphones are for our presenters. Um, that's to help things move a little bit more smoothly for us. So if you do have a question, uh, if you can go ahead and put it in that question and answer box down at the bottom of the page and we'll be monitoring that throughout the session. Um, all of our questions will be answered at the end. Uh, if you do have any questions that you would like to ask and have answered directly, please let us know and we will make sure that we get an email out to you. Um, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Juan Mendoza and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for putting this together. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Juan Mendoza and I'm an attorney at Sequoia Law in Miami. Uh, I practice bankruptcy, international insolvency and asset recovery. Um, today, I have the pleasure of moderating uh, this presentation entitled Nuts and Bolts of the Legislative Process, in which we will be providing you with a behind the scenes look at the business law section's legislative efforts. Now, um, as Stephanie mentioned, the CLE number for these presentation is 5028. And if you have any questions that you have, uh, please put them in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your page of your screen and we'll be addressing them if there's sufficient time at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, uh, I'll get us started and introduce this amazing panel who have graciously agreed to share their knowledge and insight with us today. Um, and first, we have Manny Farage, who's a shareholder of Enracket, uh, and Racket, um, Fitzgerald, Rose, Kanaka, Thomas, and Weiss. And Manny is, for one more day, the chair of the, of the Business Law Section's Legislative Committee. And he will then be transitioning to, this, to be secretary of the section. He is the past chair of various committees of the section, including the Business Litigation and Computer Law Committees. Manny also authors the case law update that is distributed to section members and others. Next, we have Kenny, Kenneth Dante Morena, who's a partner at Damien and Valori in Miami. Um, he's, he's a federal appointed receiver, a federal court appointed receiver, receivers counsel, and business litigator with significant experience in state and federal court at the trial and appellate levels. For most of his career, Kenny has focused on representing federal and state court receivers, monitors, and other fiduciaries, as well as defrauded investors in government enforcement actions brought, brought by the SEC, the CFTC, and FTC based on securities, commodities, and consumer fraud and in asset recovery litigation and class actions arising therefrom. Kenny served as the chair of the Florida Bar Business Law Sections Task Force on the Uniform Commercial, Uniform Commercial Real Estate Receivership Act, or as we know it, uh, UCRERA, which will be discussed in today's presentation. Uh, and finally, we have Doug Bell, uh, Douglas Bell with the firm Metz, Husband, and Don PA in Tallahassee. Uh, Doug Bell focuses his practice in government affairs and administrative law, where he has worked in various policy areas focusing on healthcare, insurance, general business issues, and various local government issues. With 25 years of legislative experience, Doug represents clients such as 
Avis Budget Group, McDonald's Corporation, Progressive Insurance Company, and West Court Land Title Insurance uh, Company. Uh, here's the panel. And uh, I would like to start us off with, uh, you know, getting a little bit of an overview as to the role of the Legislative Committee and Substantive Committee. So I'll leave it to Manny for us to discuss the role of the Legislative Committee. Thank you, Juan, and thank you for inviting me to come speak. I'm really gonna enjoy this, uh, speaking with Doug and Kenny. This is gonna be a lot of fun. Hopefully we can give you some information as to how this process works. Um, as Juan said, I'm the chair of the Legislative Committee for one more day. Then uh, Stephanie Lieb, who you see on the, on the PowerPoint right there is the vice chair, will be taking over as chair. We're going to have a vice chair again next year and that will be Peter Valori. Uh, many of you know Peter and we'll have a second vice chair and that's Robert Barron. So we're in good hands coming down the pike. So let me tell you what we do. Best way to describe the committee is that we are the traffic cop uh, for legislative matters for the section. And I mean that in, in, a, in a lot of senses. Uh, we direct traffic, but we also try to do other things as well. One of the things that uh, we try to do, which some people don't quite recognize, is that um, we try to channel all the legislative efforts in one particular fashion. Um, as Doug will explain, and of those of you who know Amy, will explain, um, there are a lot of points of contact that all of us have with legislators and the legislature, um, but uh, we are subject to, we in the section are subject to certain rules and restrictions, um, which make it very difficult, if not improper, for individuals to reach out to legislators. So we oversee the legislative activities of the section in various fashions, but we also try to make sure folks understand what we do so that we can better channel their efforts at, um, at legislation. Let's talk about how we do this. Um, we review and monitor legislative filings during the session. And to, to be very, very precise, we actually review and monitor legislative filings before the session. There is a certain time period where legislators can file uh, proposed bills. As Doug will explain, uh, the House of Representatives and the Florida Senate have different requirements placed upon them, uh, but they typically start filing bills at a particular time. The sessions uh, flip year to year as to the start date uh, this coming year is going to be a January start date, as opposed to the more historically uh, traditional March start date. So what that means, and as Doug's going to explain, is that bills are actually going to start to be filed within the next couple of months. It's going to be very, very soon. We start reviewing and monitoring those filings right now, and Doug and Amy uh, keep track of those. What the members of the committee do as well is that um, they actually give information to Doug and Amy that they may hear uh, regarding a particular issue or a bill that we see out in our practice areas that they being in Tallahassee may not have run across. Uh, and we also give them information as to what's happening with particular legislators, the folks that we try to persuade to adopt our particular uh, legislation. We like to have the committee be the folks that propose legislation. Uh, we have had in the past uh, some members of the section who were freelancing, for lack of a better phrase, and were trying to propose bills and take positions that uh, weren't approved by the section. Anyone can do that. You don't have to even be a lawyer to propose a bill or speak to your legislator. But if you do do that, or if you want to do that on behalf of the section, you'll have to come through the legislative committee for the reasons we're going to talk about in, in just a second. And that's it's very important uh, because Doug and Amy are trying to juggle a lot of balls when they uh, carry forward our bills and our positions. And sometimes someone may have a position that's inconsistent with the 
announced an approved position of the legislation committee and that creates a lot of problems for us. So let, let me explain that a, a little bit further. Juan, if you could flip over to the next slide, please. As you see here, um, this slide says that we support and we defend legislative positions. And let me explain that word positions a little bit better. In order to take a quote position, we have to have that position approved by the Florida Bar. Due to a lot of litigation that occurred 20, 30 years ago, um, we have a certain process we have to follow. Keep in mind that the Florida Bar is a mandatory bar and that we have dues that you have to pay in order to become a member of the Florida Bar and continue practicing law. The concern of some folks who sued the Florida Bar was that the, uh, the dues, the mandatory dues that were being paid uh, were being used to advocate legislative positions that they did not agree with. And that creates obviously a constitutional issue uh, if a mandatory organization uses your dues for a position that you don't want to take, uh, you don't want to take. So we have to follow a, a particular pattern, procedure, process, even to the point where our positions, our, our bills, have to be approved first by the general counsel's office of the Florida Bar, and then by the Board of Governors of the Florida Bar itself. So it's, it's important that uh, everything come through the committee so that we can more properly and better um, do our job. We draft and we advance legislation. We're gonna talk in a second about um, the, the website that we've set up so that it makes it easier for you if you're drafting or advancing legislation to go through the process and figure out what's going on. What we do in the business law section um, is often very technical. For instance, Kenny's gonna talk about Ucrero, which is highly technical. Um, and what we do um, is often not within the wheelhouse of the legislators themselves. Doug's gonna talk about how many folks we have in the legislature, the lawyers, but even amongst those lawyers, not all of them are business lawyers. So we have to be very precise in how we draft and advance legislation. And that's where Doug and Amy come in and they help us do that. The legislation committee reviews legislation and it also it also helps um, committees draft particular legislation because the legislation can start with committees, it can start with other places. And one of those other places where the legislation can start is when the executive council decides it's a good idea to form a task force on a particular item. Kenny, um, Kenny's Ucrera bill came out of a task force and he's gonna tell you how it worked in this particular case and how task forces and study groups work generally with regard to legislation. Kenny, all yours. Hey, Kenny, before, before you go, I just wanna jump in on one thing that Manny alluded to. Another function of the BLS substantive committees is to review and respond to legislation that has been filed on behalf of other stakeholders. I think a lot of this slide is um, assuming that it's legislation being promoted by the business law section, but obviously there are many, many bills that have a business impact. And Amy and I send that information to the legislative committee who then forwards it on to the substantive committees for their review. And if we need to get engaged from a technical or other standpoint, uh, we do respond in that way as well. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you, so moving ahead, uh, I, we can move forward and discuss the, what are the efforts on advancing and supported legislation, uh, more technical things. Oh. So if you can, sorry, you want to go back? Yeah, I think so. I, I think Kenny wants to explain to us how uh, the task forces and the study groups work, especially how it worked in his, uh, in his uh, UCRA uh, process. Sure. So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. 
So we uh, we have a slide later on that kind of walks through from beginning to end, you know, from idea to law. But I'll just give a quick preview because I think there are two slides in between that we want to address. But in the case of UCRERA, which was a Uniform Real Estate uh, Receivership Act, um, Commercial Real Estate Receivership Act, we um, we were approached. The business law section of the Florida Bar was approached by the Uniform Law Commission with this uniform law that they drafted and they circulated around the country to try to get it enacted in all states. And so it was presented to the business law section and two particular substantive committees of the business law section, um, the bankruptcy UCC and the business litigation committees were interested in the act and decided that it would be appropriate to form a a task force to further study it to determine if it's appropriate for the state of Florida, if it's beneficial to all interested parties. And so those two substantive committees agreed that it was. And so at an annual meeting of the Florida Bar and the business law section, the two committees uh, went to the executive council at that annual meeting in June of 2016 and proposed that a, a section wide or cross committee task force be formed to study UCRERA. And at that executive council meeting, the UCRERA task force was created, and I was appointed as, as a chair of that task force. And that's where the work really began, where we dug into the uh, uniform law and studied it, made recommendations. And um, I can talk more about that when the slide comes up, but I just wanted to give you a little preview of that's how this task force um, was formed in this particular instance with UCRERA being the example we're, we're discussing today. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, now we're moving forward to um, the things or the projects we can do to advance and support the legislative positions. And uh, Kenny, if you can talk a little bit more about uh, how you dealt with in UCRERA, I guess, with the triple motion and uh, drafting proposed bills, the white paper, and working with the sectional lobbyists and doing stuff, that'd be great. Sure. So again, with UCRERA as the example, we um, before, well before the triple motion came up, you know, we had a lot of work to do throughout. It was at least three and a half years where we actually worked on this uniform law to make it consistent with Florida law, but also to recommend that certain changes be made to Florida law that would be beneficial to all parties to a commercial real estate receivership proceeding. So we, we went through three and a half years of revisions. We invited various other interested parties outside the section to participate. And again, I'll get into that with a later um, slide. But um, we got to the point where we completed what we thought was uh, the, the law was in good shape and presentable to the business law section executive council. Um, but before we got to the executive council meeting, we, I guess, put UCRERA to a vote at the substantive committee levels and both the bankruptcy UCC and the business litigation committees voted to um, present UCRERA as revised by the task force to the executive council on a triple motion. And so it was presented in that fashion. A triple motion was presented and voted on, and I believe it passed unanimously with maybe a few abstentions. But um, that was the, the, a quick version of the process to get to the triple motion, but that's a fast forward on three and a half, four years or three and a half years of work. Um, in that process, there was a, we prepared a white paper to circulate to the substantive committees and present to the executive. Hey, Kenny, before you package, move yeah. off that topic, let me jump in real quick. Cause sure. one area that a lot of folks have a hard time getting their arms around and that's the triple motion itself. Because uh, you go to these EC meetings or you go in a committee meeting and everybody says, okay, we're going to do a triple motion. And you ask the person next to you and they go, what's a triple motion? And they often say, I have no idea. <laughs> um, what you see on the screen, section 9.50A, that's the standing board policies of the Florida Bar Board of Governors. Uh, we won't go into the actual description of the litigation itself. But what ended up happening is that we adopted, we, the Florida Bar, adopted a policy, a procedure in order to determine that we were not running afoul of these uh, opinions and these consent decrees that we entered into with various organizations in order to advance legislative positions since we are a unitary bar, a mandatory bar. And it's 
very long. I'm happy to read the entire section for you. Uh, but uh, here is what the triple motion comes down to. You really need three things. One, you need to determine that the, the motion itself, the legislative position is within the subject matter of the section, number one. Number two, you have to determine that it's not inconsistent with a Florida bar position. And number three, this is what gets a lot of attention a lot of times and frankly, has some legislation in the, in the framework where it's not able to move forward. We have to determine that the, the, the proposed legislation or legislative position is not divisive. Um, we are a unitary, a mandatory bar. And that last part is part of the, the litigation uh, that arose and we have to make sure that we determine all three. When we get to um, the Board of Governors, when we send it to uh, the General Counsel for the Florida Bar, we have to certify, uh, Doug and Amy actually have to certify that um, that, that particular position is not um, divisive and it otherwise meets the triple motion. So I, I, I interrupted you, Kenny, uh, sorry about that. I just wanted to make sure that got out there before we We've moved on. Thank you, Manny. Uh, and, and Kenny, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the white paper entails. Sure. So, uh, I mean, a white paper is really just a description of the proposed law um, it, it, written in a manner that is understandable to anyone, even experts outside the particular field, as Manny suggested. A lot of laws, including UCRARA, are highly technical and lawyers and other interested parties who deal with receiverships all the time may, may understand the concepts and, and provisions in the uniform law, but we need to explain it to those who might not be familiar. And so we do so through a white paper, which describes the law and also the, the context of the law, why the law is necessary and how it will benefit. Uh, Florida jurisprudence and the uh, litigants who might be involved in commercial real estate receiverships. And so it's really just a, it, it varies from a one to five page description of the law and, and, um, and why, why it would be beneficial. Thank you. And, hey, Juan, let me just jump in. This is an example of where the business law section uh, is very different from many other legislative stakeholders. Uh, this white paper, um, it is, it, it's often, it, it has to be technical and you try to make it as, as simple as possible because, but because these concepts are often very complicated, explaining them is also complicated. So these white papers are often, unfortunately read by only a very few people certainly read by the committee staff and, uh, and our bill sponsors and maybe a few of the lawyers who are gonna see this. But one of the things in this next bullet here is working with the section lobbyists. One thing that Amy and I do is we, we work with the committee or the task force and try to uh, condense down the white paper to what we call a talk sheet, which is a, which is a one page document that explains the problem, explains the solution, talks a little bit about stakeholders, who's, who's for it, who's against it. Um, and we, we try to gel it into just one page because that's about all legislators often have time to read before they go into committee. Thank you, Doug. And in terms of timing, when would be the right time uh, to you know, bring, bring on board the section lobbyists to start advising in these reviews or the drafting of proposed legislation. I can, uh, I can jump in on that. I think uh, the section lobbyist needs to be in there from the very, very start. Just as if you had a, uh, a, a deal you were putting together or a case you were litigating, one of the first things you do is you get the experts involved so they can assist you. For instance, Amy and Doug would be able to uh, tell you what direction your particular uh, issue may want to go. They have their fingers on the pulse of the legislature. They know 
who is uh, who are the committee chairs. They know the folks that are going to be moving up into committee chair positions. Uh, so they can tell you what's the best way to present that particular um, that particular issue so that it's, it's easily read. Uh, and also Amy and Doug have extraordinary contacts with lobbyists um, in the other um, groups that are in Tallahassee. We often run across um, positions that are taken by the Florida Chamber or, or AIF or some other groups. And Amy and Doug know those folks really well together with knowing the lobbyists for the other sections of the Florida Bar. One of the things that we have to do with the new legislative position request form, and by the way, this is all on the Legislation Committee webpage at the Business Law section um, um, uh, webpage. And there are various documents there. You can run right through them and they'll explain this entire process to you. But one of the things that we'll need to do now with the Florida Bar's new rules not only do we need the proposed bill, and there's a form for drafting the bill on the website, we not only need the white paper, but we also need the legislative position request form. And that form now has a section that says, have you contacted other members of the Florida Bar in order to see what their position is on this particular legislation? Amy and Doug are very good at knowing who the other members, uh, lobbyists for these other sections are, and getting us in contact with those folks um, in order to help us um, figure out if there's any problems. It's a practical matter. If two or more sections of the Florida Bar are not agreeing on a particular position, then we've got uh, a real hard time. Amy and Doug will tell you this, we're gonna have a real hard time getting our proposal moved forward. And, and Kenny can talk about what he did with UCRA uh, in order to make sure that a very technical bill, which had some initial objections, um, was able to move forward because of a lot of legwork at the front end. Thank you. Um, we're gonna move along to discuss uh, how an idea becomes a, a law. And this is uh, something I think, Doug, uh, you could perhaps give us a little bit of insight how it comes, how it starts from its formation, perhaps in the business law section, and uh, how it ends up being becoming law. Sure, thanks. This is a, this is a schematic that we, we got from the legislature. It's kind of a schoolhouse rock thing. So concerned citizens over here, you can put your, your best friend from the business law section, their face on those bodies there. That's, that's us. And, and Manny and Kenny have just talked about the process of getting to whatever your suggested legislation is. And then Amy and I, we do an evaluation of who the best alternative legislators may be based upon experience they might have with the subject matter. Uh, as I'll show later, there are quite a few lawyers that are, that are in the legislature. Unfortunately, I wanna say only two are members of the business law section, but nonetheless, there are topics that we work on that just as lawyers uh, going back to their law school days, at least they might have a little better understanding of them than, uh, than others. But we look at their, at their business or, or other background. We look at which committees they serve on because we will know uh, based on the subject matter of the legislation, which committees it's most likely to go through. And that's how we decide who, who the legislators are that we will go and ask to sponsor the bill. And then once they've agreed, they will submit our draft to bill drafting. And the House and Senate each have their own department, if you will, called bill drafting. And that consists of some of them are lawyers, some of them are not. And there are various stages that they go through of, of review and evaluation of a bill draft. And it's a pretty complicated um, process if you're not getting a bill draft from the business law section because we, because of all the hard work that the BLS committee or task force does, have already thought through a lot of the statutory issues such as cross-references and making sure it's appropriate language consistent with case law or whatever it is. And unlike many other clients, the business law section needs to be 
intimately involved in the bill drafting because all of the words and the commas and everything have a huge impact on what the bill really means and whether it has the, the effect that you all uh, are desiring. So there's a lot of back and forth during the bill drafting process. And these next few stages are, the next couple stages are a lot of behind the scenes stuff that, that we work on. A very important element is the committee and subcommittee. And those committees, as you'll see later, they begin meeting several months before the actual session begins. And the committees are where most of the work really gets done. As you, as you all know, um, general, uh, the, the committees are where the bills are reviewed, heard, and so forth. And by the time it gets to the floor, much of the hard work has already been done. Uh, and then, as I said, we get to the calendar, and that's a lot of behind the scenes lobbying to actually get the bill heard on the calendar. And the same with the committees to get the bill heard. There's a lot of lobbying that we need to do. Uh, and then I would say the last process, if it's controversial, we would need to work a lot with the governor to make sure that, that he is, is going to sign it or does not veto it. Um, rarely, though, are business law sections. Actually, I've never seen one that was, once it got to the governor's desk, all the controversy had been worked out and everybody was, was uh, singing from the same hymnal, if you will. So I've gone through this quickly, and, but touched on some of the key elements here. There is a great deal of work, but uh, in the interest of time, I think we can jump on to the next slide, unless anybody has any chat questions or anything later. Uh, yeah, but one thing I, I, I hope that you could touch upon, even if quickly, uh, Doug, would be uh, we talk about advancing legislation. What happens when you're we're met with resistance, perhaps by other sections, and you're in the lobbying process? How do you uh, typically address that? Well, as as Kenny and Manny mentioned before, part of the the development of the bill during the triple motion process is working with other sections. And even after that, other sections or the bankers or different stakeholders may, may come up with some objections. And what Amy and I tried to do from the very beginning, before the bill even goes into bill drafting, is we reach out to people that we know will have an interest and we float to them a draft of the legislation so that they can be looking at it and giving us suggestions and letting us know about their heartburn if they have any early on so that we address their concerns as soon as possible so that it doesn't gum up the works during this committee process. Because even though committees go on for several months, there, there are sometimes there's only one committee week during a month and you're only gonna get one, a committee is only gonna meet once during that committee week. So you've got to make sure that you are working your bill through the process as quickly as possible. Otherwise, you may run out of time. So we work with those other stakeholders. We get their input, and then we connect their legal professionals with our committee members or task force members. And we have meetings to try to hash out the, the concerns, redraft the language, come up with something that is mutually agreeable, go to our bill sponsor, and make sure that he or she is also okay with it because what we've got to never forget is that this isn't the BLS bill. This is you know, Representative Smith's bill. So uh, that's, I hope that answers your question, Juan. Uh, that does, thank you, uh, Doug. And I think we can now move forward to uh, something we've been foreshadowing, which is your CRERA. Uh, and that is uh, quite a big bill, uh, quite a big project. And Kenny, if you can give us uh, your, your thoughts first, um, an introduction as to what it is, and then talk about how we took this from an idea and made a uh, legislation. Sure. So as the slide explains, UCRERA is a, it's a uniform and comprehensive body of law that provides for all of the conditions under which you can get a receiver appointed in a commercial real estate receivership proceeding um, or dispute involving commercial real estate. 
It sets forth the powers and duties and liabilities of a receiver, um, all the procedures that would revolve around a receivership proceeding, um, the scope of the actions that would be uh, subject to or that would be able to invoke UCRERA in order to have a receiver appointed, and, um, and various other provisions. And so it's, it's, it's very complete and it's a great roadmap for any and all parties and the judges involved in commercial real estate receiverships. And, um, you know, at first when it was presented to BLS, we all thought it would be use, most of us thought it would be useful, but there are provisions in the uniform law that had to be worked out to be consistent with Florida law. But overall, I think the consensus was after a few months of studying it, that it would be useful and beneficial to the parties and to the Florida law. So that, that's, a, that's a general description of the act. And again, it has multiple subsections and it was enacted under chapter 714 of the Florida statutes in um, last July. So July 1st, 2020, it became effective when the governor signed it into law a few days earlier. And it's known as the Uniform Commercial Real Estate Receivership Act. And um, it, it again, as the title would suggest, applies only to commercial real estate, not residential real estate. So if you want a receiver over residential real estate, you would not invoke UCRERA to do so. You would utilize the applicable case law. Um, and, um, and, and this act is working its way around the country. Again, like I said earlier, the Uniform Law Commission did send this uniform law around the country and attempted to have various states enacted into law. And as of today, it has been enacted in nine states, those nine states listed on at the bottom of the slide. And it has been introduced in two additional states, Connecticut and Rhode Island. So it is making its way through the country and becoming the law. Um, and um, not necessarily the exact version that Florida enacted, because we did make changes, as, as I'll generally describe it with the next slide, but it is some form of UCRERA is making its way and becoming the law throughout the country. So um, with this slide, we already discussed some of the, um, some of the bullet points, but I, I did wanna touch on, on how important it is and how we realized this early to get other stakeholders involved in the process very early on having learned from other uh, attempts to get legislation through where it didn't necessarily, we didn't get the stakeholders on board early enough and it, it caused issues down the road with UCRERA, we decided within the first year of the task force, uh, tax, task force's creation, we, in, um, we reached out to the, uh, the Florida real property section of the Florida bar. And uh, with the assistance of Manny, we got them to uh, provide their input, but also um, I believe they formed their own subcommittee or committee where they were independently studying it, but we, we were taking the lead. And so we invited the real property section to participate in our task force early on, I think as early as the beginning of 2017, um, less than a year after the formation of the task force, we had a real property section member attending our monthly meetings and providing input and weighing in on what they believed should be changed to UCRERA or what sections they wanted you know, to, to tweak or, or add additional language. And we listened to them. And in fact, uh, Manny arranged for an in-person presentation of UCRERA and the changes that the BLS made to the real property section at one of their summer meetings. And so Judge Mora, Judge Mindy Mora, who was on the task force, um, and I went up to Palm Beach and did a full presentation of UCRERA with our changes. And we fielded questions and we received input over the weeks that followed that presentation. And then we worked really hard on trying to incorporate some of the suggestions and proposed revisions that the real property section requested. And we, so we worked then over the next several months after that presentation, we worked with them to incorporate the changes in to the law. And then we reached, once we felt like we had a, a, a law that both the real property section and the business law section were happy with, we then reached out to the Florida Bankers Association and the Florida Land Title Association to get their input. 
And both of those organizations provided their input, provided their changes. And we went back and forth between those two organizations and the real property section and the business law section to try to incorporate all everyone's changes, reconcile them where appropriate and necessary, and come up with a body of law that all four of those organizations were happy with. And, um, and then we reached out finally to the Uniform Law Commission, who were following what we were doing over the years, but they have an interest in creating, having this uniform law. So they didn't necessarily like all of the changes that we were proposing. And so they pushed back a little bit and we pushed back a little bit and we got to a point where everybody was pleased with the act. And that's where we started really working with our lobbyists to get legislative sponsors, which they were able to do. Doug and Amy did a magnificent job of getting two terrific sponsors, uh, Senator Berman and Representative Beltran, and they provided their input on the now the, the law that we had revised, um, and we made a few more changes based on some of the suggestions they made. And then I believe at that point in time, this is around towards the end of 2019, we then presented it to our lobbyists who then sent it to bill drafting, as we discussed earlier. And then it was put in the format that bills are, are, uh, are, are written in. And, um, and from there, the lobbyists took over and, and shepherded it through the Florida legislature um, with the going to the various committees on both chambers. And I, there were uh, several committee hearings where we sent a member of the task force to those hearings to be there in case any of the legislators had questions regarding the act and the revisions we were proposing. And it sailed through those committee hearings, my understanding, without much debate, if any, and, and made it to the floor eventually of each chamber. And it was unanimously passed in both chambers. And that was in the beginning of March of 20. 20 last year. And um, from there, we, it, was, it went on to the governor. And uh, eventually, by, I think by the end of June, Governor DeSantis signed it into law and it became effective July 1st last year. Thank you uh, for the explanation, uh, Kenny, and for taking us step by step of how we took that or how you were able to shepherd that all the way to uh, becoming a law. Uh, and uh, up next, we'll have a discussion or an overview of the legis uh, of the legislation, uh, Florida legislation by Doug Bell. Uh, we'll get started, Doug. Sure, I'm going to talk a little bit about the elected officials in Tallahassee, and um, so you know we've got the Florida House, the Florida Senate. We also have the executive branch as well. So this is the governor and the cabinet. Um, all of these folks are up for re-election in 2022, and uh, Commissioner Nikki Freed, the Commissioner of Agriculture, is not going to run for re-election. We believe she's going to run uh, for governor, so she's got primary with uh, Charlie Crist. You may know that name. You may have heard of him before. Uh, so we, in addition to working with the legislature, Oftentimes, the issues are also somehow um, within a silo that some of these cabinet officials are concerned about or work within. So we don't want to, um, we don't neglect them during the legislative process and the putting together of, of bills and working with various stakeholders. Uh, primarily, it's the governor's office, but we, we, we don't wanna wait until the end to talk to these folks. So while Amy and I and the key people from the various task forces and sub and committees are talking to legislators about the issues, we're also talking to the appropriate cabinet member staff as well. And then going on to the next slide on the, from the legislative branch, you've got the House and the Senate and uh, the House is made up of 120 members, 78 Republicans, 42 Democrats, and the Senate's got 40 members, 24 Republicans, and 16 <laughs> Democrats. We're about to go through redistricting, reapportionment. So districts will, will change after this next session. And during the 2022 election, November of 2022, all 160 of these 
legislators will be up for, or, or seats will be up for election. Normally, uh, the Senate members are, they have four year terms. So half of the Senate runs every two years. Because it's redistricting, everyone is gonna be running. There's gonna be a good deal of shifting. We've already got people who are, who have resigned from legislative seats to run for Congress. Um, and, and that creates a set of dominoes, whether if it's folks for the Senate, they're going to, you may have house members running. It's people from the house. Uh, you'll have local folks running or just people who've never been in office before. And then going to the next slide, this is the majority and minority leadership. Uh, for this next session, we'll continue to have Senator Wilton Simpson from Pasco County as the Senate president. Chris Sprouse, who is a lawyer from um, Pinellas County, will continue to be the speaker of this next session. The minority leaders are Lauren Book, and she did not begin this last session as minority leaders. As the minority leader, she came in mid, um, mid session as a result of uh, unhappiness with the existing leader. And then in the House, we've got this unique dual leadership here with Evan Jenny and Bobby DuBose. Going forward in the 2022-2024 time period, the, the Senate minority leader will continue to be Lauren Book and the House minority leader will not be Ben Diamond, and that, this is Ben's picture up here, but as I mentioned, Ben is one of those who is going to be, who is running for an open congressional seat, and uh, the House Minority Leader will be Ramon Alexander, and none of them are, are lawyers. However, on the Republican side, the majority side, you've got uh, Kathleen Pasadomo, a member, longtime, well-respected well member of the Real Property and um, Trust Law section of the bar. And then you have our good friend, uh, Paul Renner, as, uh, coming in as speaker during that period, and he is a member of the Business Law section. And then, uh, you know, these guys, they run for speaker, like almost when they run for their very first election. Uh, so we, we're looking out all the way to 2024, 2026, with Danny Perez is the designated House Speaker for that time period. Uh, we don't yet know who the Senate President will be during that time period. There are a couple front runners, but I won't, I won't uh, speculate in, in today's meeting on that. So moving on to the next slide, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of lawyers in the legislature and their practices are, are very diverse as you can imagine, just like the, the general uh, population of lawyers. And uh, here you've got 21 House Republicans are lawyers and 12 House Democrats. And moving to the next slide in the Senate, you have three Republicans are lawyers and seven are Democrats. Uh, so we have a large cadre of good potential sponsors in both the House and the Senate for, for running, running BLS bills. I will say that the business law section bills are, are not partisan. They are purely policy bills. We are not a, par a partisan organization. However, we have, to, we have to acknowledge the partisanship of the legislature. And that sometimes does factor into um, working with different sponsors and so forth because we wanna make sure our bills are gonna pass. And it is very hard to pass a bill in the, in the House in particular, but in the legislature. So um, it's very good to get good co-sponsors and sponsors uh, that are lawyers, Republican and Democrat. So we try to mix that up. Um, moving yeah. on. If I wanted to ask you uh, one question before moving on. I just, I know you, you talked about finding Legislate, let, uh, legislators that will help co-sponsor bills. Uh, what's the importance of finding a legislative champion 
or somebody, or how do you guys go about identifying that those legislators that will, I guess, uh, assist in the advancing legislation? Uh, a lot of different factors. Uh, their, their, their subject matter experience, how well regarded they are in the legislature, their, what level they are uh, in terms of how long they've been in the legislature. It's, you like to have somebody that's, that's higher up in leadership, but they are not allowed to carry as many bills. So we do often use um, freshmen uh, that they're on the correct committees. If, if you serve on certain committees, uh, through which the bill is going to be heard, it's more likely that your bill will be heard as a matter of courtesy because you actually sit on that committee. So there are a lot of different factors uh, that go into it, and those are a few of them. Let's move forward. The, this next slide here is uh, the BLS proactive priority issues. And this was this last section. We had a third round of uh, the corporation's bill. It was a, a massive project to begin with that uh, Gary Tevlum and, and Phil Schwartz led for the business law section of a complete rewrite of the Corporations Act. And uh, it was something like that. You know, certainly you're going to miss something here and there or have an, uh, just a completely unintended consequence so we've had to go back in a couple sessions and make some tweaks here and there. And uh, that's, that's just the nature of a change of that, of that size. Uh, we worked on Notice of For Foreclosure Act and uh, unfortunately didn't have success with that. The bankers had concerns about that bill. And, uh, and then the Kearney bill as well is something where we worked with the real property section um, and, and that may be something that we'll work on going forward. The, and you see at the bottom are 2020 priorities and we did get both of those bills passed. As I mentioned earlier in, my, in, uh, in response to some of Manny's comments, these are just the, the BLS proactive priority issues that have gone through this whole process that's the subject of this conversation today. But there are thousands of bills filed every session. And so Amy and I review all of the bills and any bills that we think uh, members of the business law section would be concerned about from a BLS perspective, we send along to the appropriate subject matter BLS committees for their review and comment. And then we work with the legislators um, on those issues as well. So there's a lot that we do beyond the proactive priority issues. And Juan, you can go to the next slide. Um, as Manny mentioned, the, the session begins in January on, uh, on even years. It's a 60 day session pursuant to the constitution. And then in odd years, it's March through May. And the committee weeks begin generally three months beforehand. And because it is a long process for, for you all to, um, to get a finished product through your internal steps with the BLS section, and then there is a, a time period for Amy and I working with stakeholders, and then there's the whole time frame of working with, with bill drafting it's very important to begin the process early. And I think that the timeline that is set forth in the, in the web link that Manny mentioned earlier that you'll see at the end of the slide, that timeline does take into consideration this timeline that's on your screen here uh, because you've got to start things very early. Uh, but as I said, committee weeks generally are three months beforehand, and you can see this slide here for the next, getting us all the way out to the 2023 session. And that, on that point, Doug, I think it bears repeating um, just how much advanced uh, time you and Amy need, because we need to get anything that comes out of EC has to go first to general counsel of the Florida Bar, and then it has to go 
to the Board of Governors at their next scheduled meeting, which of course aren't every week. Uh, so anytime you, you may be looking at six to eight weeks before the bill actually gets filed, where we need to need for it to come out of EC. You, you might even talk about some of the stuff we're doing right now for the 2022 20, um, session. Sure, well, uh, you, you've got committees that are, that are proposing different bills for the 2022 session. And uh, they're going through, going through that process that we've talked about. You've got a, a judgment lien bill um, judgment lien proposal, you have a UCC pick your partner proposal and a service of process proposal, all for potential BLS priority bills. And I, I, what I was looking for is I've, I've got a list and uh, I'm already looking at who the potential sponsors are, even though these are not official, official positions yet. Um, I've, I, we're already working to get our ducks in a row, Amy and I are, so that we don't miss any time at all. And as soon as they're official, we'll get them into bill drafting, knowing that bill drafting will take a considerable amount of time to work on these issues because we don't wanna end up well into the committee week process and just then getting our bill filed because it takes a long time. Once you get the bill filed, then you've gotta get it referred to committees by the speaker's office. And that takes, uh, often takes weeks um, so it's, it's just a long process overall. Thank you, Doug. And, uh, you know, I think the next slides, what we do is we have provided the resources, uh, on the business law section website on the, which we, we believe some, a lot of this material is located and, uh, the pertinent, uh, documents are here. Uh, one is named sections, legislative committee policy and procedures of 2020 and 2021. Uh, and uh, here's a link to the website. I think the materials will be distributed afterwards. And here are the other resources that Doug was referring to. And I think we might have uh, time for one question. Uh, uh, Manny, I'm not, I think Manny, you're going to address uh, this question by Gary. You know, Doug, do you see uh, Gary's question there? He wanted us to talk about enrolled and grows, TP, all that other good stuff. Some of, some of the legislative positions and the, and the steps that the bill takes. Okay, yeah. Well, I think one other thing he asked about is, it asked us to mention is how much work the, the BLS lawyers, not, not me and Amy, but how much work Kenny, Manny, Gary, Phil have to do with the actual legislators to, to respond to their questions, to help prepare documents, to sit in on the committees and, and to hear firsthand um, what, the, what the questions and comments are during the presentation of the bill. So we, it's great to have you in person here in the committee. So you can mention something to me or Amy in response, or you could hop up to the podium and respond to questions or concerns. But at the very least, you need to be watching the committee live and texting me and Amy who are sitting there in the committee and we can text the legislator. If they're in the Senate, we can't text them in the House. Uh, so it's important to be that engaged um, in real time. And then I, the process of when a bill is amended, then you have a committee substitute, which is a CS. And when you have a CS, then the bill can be re-referred to different committees after it gets through the one where it was amended. And if it is amended on the floor, it is, uh, the, the amendment is, is uh, engrossed in there. So it's a different terminology for the same thing, not a committee substitute, but where you can, where you combine the changes into the bill so that it's only one, one document. And then enrolled is when the bill has been passed by the legislature and it will be sent to the governor at some point. Uh, once it's passed by the legislature by both chambers, uh, then it is sent to the governor and typically the legislature will wait for the governor to say, okay, I'm ready for you to send me this bill. Because once the governor receives a bill, if it's, if it's received after session, 
uh, he has only 15 days to respond and he can sign the bill, he can veto the bill, or if he does not act, the bill will go into effect without his signature. If the governor receives a bill during the legislative session, he has seven days to act. I think that was it. I may, I'm not sure if I missed anything from Gary's question, but I know somebody else asked a question about what is TP. Um, TP in the legislative vernacular is temporarily postpone. So if a bill is on an agenda in a committee and the, the, the sponsor decides that he doesn't, he or she doesn't, they don't have the votes or they, they want to pause and deal with it later, the bill sponsor will, will ask that the bill is, is temporarily postponed. So it will be in a holding pattern in that committee. One, one final question uh, for folks who are, aren't as familiar with the process as you are. Uh, a lot of times you see references to in minutes. What does that mean? Okay. Um, that means when the bill is being, um, it's in messages. Messages, excuse me. Okay, you confused me for a second. I was, I, 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 I I was yeah, stalling I to try to get your answer and then it came to me. Um, in messages is when the bill has passed one chamber and is being delivered to the other chamber. And it is a, it is a physical process where you have to take a hard copy of the bill and walk it over to the other chamber. Now, obviously, it only takes five minutes to, to do the actual walking. But in, in the system, when you're looking at the status of a bill, if it's in messages, that means it's it's been passed by one chamber and it's, it's in the process of being sent to the other chamber for them to put on one of their calendars and take up and determine whether they're gonna amend it again or accept the changes and send the bill to the governor. I think, uh, I don't think we have any further questions and actually we're right on time. So uh, good job keeping in traffic everyone. And, uh, you know, I think we're finalized with this presentation. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Manny, Doug, and Kenny so much for, uh, you know, attending and providing this with this really informative panel. Thank you to Stephanie for setting it up. And thank you to all the attendees for, for coming. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot today. Uh, Stephanie. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.